Each week at this time, the National Broadcasting Company presents War Telescope, a weekly report on the war as seen by NBC's reporter John McVean in London. We take you now to John McVean, the NBC newsroom in London. This is John McVean in London. A little while ago, one of the many invasion exercises was taking place on the coast of Britain. Everything had been carefully planned. The three services, Army, Navy, and Air Force of two nations were involved. Just as a group of landing craft approached the shore, the weather changed. The sun disappeared, and one of those quick sea fogs enveloped the landing craft and the beaches. The troops making the mock attack, and the troops guarding the shore. In one invasion craft, some soldiers, weird figures in their May West life belts, were huddled together, waiting for the moment that the boat touched shore. One man was worried. He said, this is the moment we should be getting our air support. Where are our planes? And through the fog came a voice saying, the only air support you'll get today, pal, is the air support you'll get from that blank, blank May West you're wearing. That was one GI's view. But today we're going to have a little more expert view of the whole business of air support. As the day of invasion approaches, thousands of British and American planes on airfields all over Britain are ready to launch the greatest blow that air forces have ever struck in cooperation with the ground troops. From the air standpoint, the invasion is on. These planes are flying thousands of sorties against the enemy. They're grouped under one command, the Allied Expeditionary Air Force, headed by Air Chief Marshal Sir Trafford Lee Mallory. American Ninth Air Force, British Second Tactical Air Force, combined to form General Eisenhower's Air Arm, the air power of Supreme Headquarters. The functions of the AEAF are varied. Troop carriers and gliders and hospital planes are only a few of the types of aircraft. But most important are the striking planes, the fighters, fighter bombers and bombers that will reach out ahead of our troops to blast the way across the continent. Fighters that will guard the fighting men of the Allied nations from enemy air attack. And today are already driving the Luftwaffe out of the air. Eisenhower and Montgomery know the value of close air support for ground troops. Both of them have in the past develop new air ground tactics with airmen like Tedder, Brereton, and Cunningham. This time, all the past experience of the two countries will go into the air hammer that'll crack down on enemy defenses with terrific force. You'll hear much about air support for our troops in these coming months. You'll probably hear complaints and praise alike. What is close air support? What can ground troops expect from it? Why didn't it work at Casino? Will it work in the second front, and how? Questions like these you may hear any day from the commentators or read in the paper. And to give you an expert view on close air support, I've invited two members of the Allied Expeditionary Air Force to discuss the whole matter. They are a Britisher, Group Captain Richard Atchley, who wears the Order of the British Empire and the Air Force Cross, and an American, Colonel John Ulrichson of Monterey, California. Group Captain Atchley is concerned with the training of the air support units that will take part in the Second Front. Colonel Ulrichson, a West Point graduate, commands a Ninth Air Force group of Mustang fighters. Now, would you gentlemen like to define the function of close air support? It's really a little hard to put in simple terms. You can say that military operations in the field require a concentration of all arms for a single purpose. In this concentration, the combination of air and ground plays a vital part. The Germans were the first to discover that in 1939 with their tank bomber team. We have developed that idea. That sounds a little fancy, actually. I'd think more in terms of keeping the enemy air power away, plus close support by attacking vital targets behind the enemy lines. You had operational control of the fighters and fighter bombers of the Desert Air Force, didn't you, Group Captain? You must know a good deal about the development of air support on our side. He certainly does. I've heard him lecture AEAF officers on it. Thanks. We didn't have much chance to develop our support back in the days of Dunkirk. It did become obvious that something was lacking. That something was worked out in the only place that our troops were in a position to do any fighting, the western desert of Africa. Yes. <clears throat> I'd say that our American concepts of air support have also changed completely in the last two years. We used to think only of bombing factories, railheads, and other strategical targets, and providing a fighter air defense. Well, can you tell me what it's all about today? What is the AEAF, and how does it work? 
The headquarters is a completely interlocked command. You have a British commander, and he has an American deputy, or vice versa. All links in the chain. Nationality doesn't count. You mean an officer of one nationality may be exercising control over the air forces of another? That's it. When the operation begins, we can switch the whole Allied force wherever we want it. One might say that there are two forms of support. The indirect or strategical, knocking out railway yards, oil wells, and other targets far behind the enemy lines. The other form is the direct, quicker tactical support. We set the enemy's house on fire and he has to put it out. We hit him, his defense positions, and everything else that needs hitting near the front. Air support for an army is the exercise of our superiority. The army wants you to do something, clobber someone. That sometimes means that the army asks you to put out a man's left eye and leave his right eye alone. Uh, did the American squadrons think the same, Colonel? Just about the same. American squadrons arriving here from America are pretty well trained in close support. My own group, for instance, worked very closely with an armored division out in California. Since we arrived here, we've been accompanying strategic bombing missions and attacking various objectives in occupied territory. Incidentally, that's very good training, Alderson. If you can find and hit targets in Europe today, you can find and hit other targets in Europe tomorrow. How about recognizing troops of different nationalities from the air? Is that hard or easy? Just recognizing troops as such when you're moving at 400 miles an hour is practically impossible. What you can expect is to be well enough briefed by maps and photographs so that you can find a particular target and hit it. Without proper briefing, you can't tell who or what you're hitting. Briefing is good training for both sides. The army man must be able to describe the target he wants hit. Briefly, quickly, and accurately. The pilot must be able to find it on his map from the description, then recognize it when he reaches it. And an enemy pillbox can be very hard to find from the air. The view of a man on the ground who sees perhaps one hill and one pillbox is different from the man in the air who sees many hills, perhaps many pillboxes. The nippiest aircraft for this job is the fighter bomber. If the army wants the backlight knocked out of someone's push bike between now and a quarter past the hour, the best plane is to fight a bomber. Well, what's the role of the fighter in close support? It has two roles, fighter cover and ground attack. The fighter protects our ground forces from enemy attacks, makes enemy fighter bombers jets and their bombs, and the fighter attacks with gunfire. An airplane coming against ground troops with its guns going is a very frightening weapon. It gives the enemy the impression that there's no future in fighting. Now, Ben, what's the function of the airplane on the battlefield working with ground troops? Hearing the reports of the casino, it seemed as though bombers blasted the town to bits, but our troops still couldn't walk in. Well, aircraft don't deliver a knockout blow against ground forces. If they did, uh, air power could carry out an invasion alone and just bring in the uh, post exchange behind it. <laughs> Airplanes on the battlefield are more of a anesthetic. Your air force is a tag. If you hit with your army immediately afterwards, they have half-stunned men to deal with. But if you wait a little while, the enemy recovers and fights as hard as he ever did. I've noticed that uh, when we attack flak towers in Europe, the gunners are well protected behind concrete. But we can always make them put their heads down and stop firing. Sometimes, of course, we do more than that. Mm. Well, what about the Luftwaffe in the coming battle? Do you think the Germans have been saving up their planes? I think so. They've, they're probably using them as carefully as they can. We sometimes find no, no fighter opposition over Europe, and on some other days, the sky seems full of them. Mm. Now, I think you can take it to certain, however, that before this battle's over, the Luftwaffe won't be taking part in it. Until that moment, we must anticipate stiff resistance, however. What's happened with the tactical close support planes in other invasions? At Salerno, the fighters protected troops and shipping from the enemy air force. Bombers and fighter bombers answered military calls. The bombers and the fleet guns took the place of artillery before we had artillery established ashore. When the Germans sent reinforcements, Air Chief Marshal Tedder put the whole bomber force onto them and busted them up. Well, what can the ground troops expect from their air forces? That is, what about the view of the ordinary G.I. or Tommy slugging it out in the mud or in the hills? There are certain things that our power can do for him. Certain things it can't. Remember that the man on the ground sees only a small part of the battle. If he's opposed by one jeep and two pillboxes, he may want our support to knock them out. 
without realizing that Smith, just over the next hill, is opposed by two jeeps and three pillboxes. So, if the first man doesn't get the planes, he can be pretty sure that they're doing a bigger job somewhere else. If the doughboy had all the planes he wants, they'd be packed in so thickly, there would be a lot of collisions. Yeah, but it's certainly comforting when you're on the ground to see your own planes overhead. If every soldier had the air support he wants, he'd have a plane circling him personally, and we'd have lost the battle. But can the troops expect to be bombed? Sometimes, yes. But if a man on the ground sees ten enemy planes, he may not realize that, say, 300 planes started out. The other 290 never arrived on the battlefield, and the ten that did won't get home, thanks to our air umbrella. Another reason that the soldier may not get planes when he wants them is weather. But at least when our planes can't get to the battlefield, the enemy can't either. It might also be well for the soldier to remember that if he doesn't see his own planes, it may be because he, he himself hasn't carried up bombs and gasoline from the beach to the landing grounds. A plane on the offensive is more valuable than a plane on the defense. The real competition is for the ground forces not to see any planes, his own or the enemy's. If the G.I. does not see his aircraft, he can know that they're probably off attacking the enemy. And from the command point of view, the soldiers should know that they're probably attacking targets his own general has chosen. Well, how are targets chosen? What happens when, say, a battalion commander wants something hit to the air? Well, the request goes immediately to Army headquarters to be considered by ground and air authorities waiting together. They probably have many requests, and the Army commander chooses the most important. The air officer tells him whether the target is suitable, whether it can be hit from the air, and then the orders go out very quickly. I'm still interested in the viewpoint of the man on the ground. It's the one I know best. Do you think he can expect to be bombed at the beginning of the coming operation? American troops mustn't expect not to be bombed. At the beginning of such operations, there are two battles to be fought out, one on the ground and one in the air. Some chaps are bound to get through. Our men will obviously see some of them come down in flames on the battlefield, but not all of them. The man on the ground can't expect his air force to wipe out his objective, so opposition will stop. No. The Germans have learned to fight without air support. From there, we can give them, as I've said before, an anesthetic. We can stupefy them and make them less efficient, but we can't wipe them out. The ground troops will have to do that. But whether the ground troops see them or not, our air forces are working for them. We'd like to give them all a front row seat so they could see it personally, but that's impossible. Well, what would you ask from the ground troops if you had the chance? I think I'd ask the soldier to train himself very thoroughly in plain recognition so that he can distinguish his own from the enemy and not shoot down the plane that's helping him. I'd also ask him not to complain too much. There may be mistakes, but he wouldn't want his Air Force done away with on that account. How do the Air Force men, especially the Americans just arrived, feel about ground strafing and low-level fighter bombing. They're very enthusiastic. The young pilot naturally likes to beat up targets on the ground. He sees concrete results of his work, and he learns quickly. If you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to say one thing before we end. You know, how much we in the AAF have welcomed getting together, choosing the two services and swapping ideas. I think we've both changed a lot of our traditional customs, and Alrickson, when it's all over, I think you fellows will probably go back with opposite axles. What, what, what can we swap you for that? Well, if you don't mind, I think we'll just keep the post exchange. <laughs> <laughs> You've got something there, Group Captain, actually. Thank you, and thank you, Captain Alrickson. We return you now to the NBC Newsroom in New York. Every Saturday afternoon at this time, John McVean can be heard on The War Telescope. So tune in again next Saturday afternoon at this same time. This is the National Broadcasting Company.